Hi, and welcome to the Complaining Cow Consumer Show with me, Helen Dudney. Now, today I have with me Susan Bonner, who's the founder of the British Craft House. Now, this is going to be a really interesting chat because this week we've seen uh, a lot in the news and heard a lot in the news about Etsy and the reserve that they're holding on from sellers. So we're going to chat a lot about Etsy and what the British Craft House is and plans for the future. So Susan, welcome and thank you for joining me. Hi Helen. So tell me a little bit about what is going on with Etsy and why it's hit the news this week. Um, Well, it's been a bit of a pantomime, I think, really. It's interesting that the problems that Etsy have been having, they've been having for a few weeks or months even, and it's just really hit the news this week. But they have decided somewhere along the way to hold sellers' money in reserve. They arbitrarily seem to um, seem to pick on some sellers and, um, and put a, a 45 day or a 90 day reserve on their money, which means that um, essentially when they make a sale, they're expected to fulfill the sale and to post it out, but not actually get paid for it for, um, for almost three months. So clearly this hasn't gone down very well with the sellers and there's been um, a huge furrow where it's very difficult to get in touch with anybody at Etsy to, um, to, to get the decision overturned or even to find out the reasons um, be what, be, you know, why they've made the decision that, that potentially is, um, is completely affecting people's businesses to the point where they can't carry on running them. Does there seem to be any sort of logic to it other than Etsy just doing it at will and probably earning some interest on that money? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, the kind of standard answer from Etsy is that they want people to have proof of tracking. They're saying sometimes that they put shops into reserve because they've had a huge spike in sales. So their kind of outward line is that they're protecting the customers effectively from sellers who potentially are are not going to be fulfilling the orders. But the reality is that the people that I've spoken to most of the um, reasons that Etsy send as um, the reason why somebody will have been put into reserve just isn't applicable to them. A lot of them have been selling on Etsy for 10 years or more. They have an unblemished record. Um, they have all five star reviews. And in fact, one of uh, the sellers on the British Craft House um, had a sale on Etsy and um, she got the sale one day. She posted it out the following day. They arrived the following day, the customer gave a review, and then Etsy put a reserve on her account. So she didn't actually get paid for, well, I don't think she's yet been paid for the item. She then put her Etsy shop on holiday and said it definitely wasn't for her. Um, but I think the main problem is, is the fact that when you try and get in touch with them, there's no telephone line you can use. Um, not really a direct email. And when you use the contact that's within the Etsy system, you end up talking to bots who um, are unlikely really to to give you um, the answers that you need. It's just really hard to comprehend, isn't it? And is it just a UK problem or is it sort of across the board for Etsy sellers? No, I believe it's across the board. Um, I, I did think initially it was for the UK and, and because they tie into Um, or Etsy have said that a lot of it is tied into tracking and not having proof of tracking. Um, I think part of the problem with that is they're looking for UPS tracking numbers and and essentially American postal system tracking numbers, which obviously if you're you're selling in the UK, um, you're not going to have. Um, but I understand that it's um, that it's a worldwide problem and um, and pretty big within the United States as well. One of the issues with them requiring tracking as well is that obviously to send something with tracked posts costs quite a lot of money. So um, that's fine if you're selling something that's £100 or £50. But if, for example, you were selling birthday cards at £2.95, you, you're not going to send that on any kind of tracked career delivery so mm-hmm. you get proof, um, proof of arrival because you know nobody would actually pay the postal costs no which are which are huge <laughs> yeah. as we know well it looks like etsy have this week backtracked but only in in the uk isn't it and people are starting to get the removal of this reserve but not all of them 
No, I, I have one. Um, I have one seller um on the British Craft House who um has been put onto reserve this week, and um and she had a um a sale. She makes the most beautiful um wreaths, and um she had a sale to the United States. They put her into reserve, and and so basically they they they've kind of kept um you know their seventy seventy percent, um but also they they take the the percentage out of the postage as well. Um, and so the amount that she's actually being paid is not enough to cover the postage to post it, let alone getting any profit for, for yeah. what she's what she's made. And she said yesterday she could see that there were some people who were having the reserve changed from 70 percent to 30 percent. Some people were having the reserve listed lift, but she she's had nothing. She's she's still I think her, her date is kind of ridiculously at the beginning of October when she can ex- be ex- you know expected to get the money for something that she's already had to post it's just madness isn't it i mean so tell me a bit about about, about why and when you set up the british craft house because in fact it was I, I believe it was sort of more than just this reserve thing which is actually quite recent oh absolutely yeah so i used to sell on etsy i sold on etsy um from 2010 and I had a fairly busy shop. In fact, Etsy back then was really lovely, very handmade, much smaller. In fact, I went to Etsy headquarters up in Shoreditch um, on a visit. I was captain of an Etsy team, which is kind of where the British Craft House and the people behind it started. Um, and we went up to Shoreditch and had the most amazing day. And that was Etsy's idea to get all the captains of teams around the country to work out how they could grow within the UK. Obviously, they um, they did that fairly successfully. But over the years when I was selling on there, it became kind of increasingly uh, aware that, that really the, everything was set up for the American market. And in about 2017, 18, Etsy decreed that if you wanted to be seen in their searches within the site, you had to have free shipping. So this is kind of free worldwide shipping. And so... Obviously, you can choose where you want to ship to. So there'll be lots of sellers within the UK who only decide to to sell within the UK um, and people in the US who only sell to people in the US. But my market, so I sold photo albums and keepsake boxes, and my market was very much in the US. And I made Scottish themed items that, that went really down really well, kind of especially in the New York area randomly. But my books cost £14.90 to send. So that was it. You know, that's that was the postage, not packaging, not anything. Mm-hmm. You know, that was the, the pure postage cost. So my books cost thirty pounds. There is no such thing as free post. So you know, to have made it free post, I would have had to put put up the price of my books to mm-hmm. you know around about forty five pounds. At the same time, within the UK, it would have cost me just over three pounds to post the book. So by making it free in inverted commas for the US market, I would have been hugely over overcharging people in the UK. And it just felt really wrong to me that there was no way out of this. If you didn't have free shipping, then you weren't shown in searches. And obviously, then you wouldn't make any sales. And I am at the time was um, was running a group on Etsy called British Crafters. And we had lots of uh, social media, quite big accounts. And I could hear the grumblings. People were really just not happy and looking for an alternative. And I think that my my background of having been in the military is that I'm a bit of a fixer. And if a problem arises, I like to kind of think of, okay, you know, this is all a bit rubbish. How can we make it better? You know, could I do anything, you know, to, to make this better? And so I kind of had planted the seed in my head that maybe there was room for a UK platform that supported handmade. There are a few in the UK, some of them are as old as Etsy is, and they've just never really taken off. So the ethos behind the platform was that I wanted it to um, to not only be somewhere where people could sell from, but also a place where people could get support and help and guidance and kind of learn and, and grow whilst they were on the site. And yeah, so I had the impetus to, to do it in February 2019. I was training for a marathon, which was kind of crackers in itself. And I was on this hugely <laughs> long run where I kind of was doing the business plan in my head and then thinking, no, that's a really stupid idea. And uh, and then, you know, kind of listening to some music and then the, the, the thoughts would creep back in again. 
and I'm, I'm a bit of a slow runner so 18 miles is kind of the best part of the day and uh, <laughs> by the time I came back I thought no I've got to, I've got to do this I've got to I've got to try and I came in and I said to my husband I've had this brilliant idea and he's like just sit down have coffee have chocolate <laughs> you know well how did you how did you run go I'm like no 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 <laughs> And he said, well, just write it all down and um, and and see how you feel in the morning. And the following morning, I went and got a loan and, uh, and, and started the process off. So, yeah, that's kind of how how we got to the, the beginning. And then because I was really conscious that um, being the gift market is quite seasonal, I, I was really keen to try and um, try and launch before Christmas 2019. And uh, in the end, we launched on November the 1st. So uh, so we kind of caught Christmas that year which was um, which was crackers but uh, but yeah no I don't regret doing it at all it's been uh, it's been amazing how many people have you got on the platform at the moment so we're nudging up towards 400 at the moment and so they're all independent shops setting their own you know their own conditions their own dispatch times you know running their their own shops just kind of under my under my umbrella and um, I like to say that on the British Craft House, kind of, I've rounded up all the best of British creatives and put them under one roof so that people don't have to go searching for them. They can just come to, to us. And we, I have an application process because um, I have a, a vision of, of, of how I want it to look and how I want it to feel. And uh, we have lots of repeat customers. So I, I think that they like the way that it feels. It's a little bit like when you go to a village and you see a really, really nice shop and uh, you don't need anything, but you go inside to have a little look and uh, and you kind of ooh and ah and you find things you definitely didn't need, but you can't leave on the shelves. And then you leave yep. the package yep. tissue paper. And, uh, and and then when you go back to that village, you will always go back there to that shop. And that's the kind of feel that I um, that I always wanted to have. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you've got 400, but but have you, have you seen it sort of a big increase in this week as people are, must be looking for alternatives to, to Etsy now? Yes, yes. So we've had about 20 sellers join already this week. And um, I've had um, about 150 applications from people to sell. So a lot of them have been accepted. And um, I'm just waiting for them to uh, to subscribe. I think a lot of people were probably testing the water to see if they would be accepted, and that's absolutely fine. There's a few people that I unfortunately haven't been able to accept, so that's kind of the worst email to write. One of the things that we do differently to any of the other sites within the UK is that we um, pay for advertising. So every single listing on the website is advertised on Google, Google Shopping, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest. If there's a if there's a place to advertise, I pay to advertise. And that brings us in a, a huge number of sales. Um, but there's a kind of criteria really that's important with selling online, with um, having really good photographs, having um, really kind of um, a, a clear look. And, um, and I, unfortunately on Etsy, um, because they have such a huge global market and, and spend two million dollars a day on advertising you know it's it's easier on on those sites to kind of mm-hmm. hide a bit but with them um, with you know not that many items in comparison you know everything is very visible so that's why we have the application process just to make sure everything is, is completely in line with uh, with what we're looking for so what other what other things do you think that you're doing differently to Etsy because I know people are leaving leaving Etsy for, for a lot of reasons not just this reserve business we are obviously we're much smaller and um, we and we still have the human touch if uh, if a seller's got a problem if they email or if they message then um then you know i will reply i've in the past spoken to some sellers on the phone if um if they need help talking through a particular thing sometimes that's easier than um, than going through kind of 10 emails we have a different kind of payment system to the one that um, the etsy uses in that the um, the relationship financially is between the customer and the seller, whereas Etsy has this obligation to fulfil orders, etc., which is why they keep the the seller's money back. But for me, it's all completely with the bank. And so we, um, in our four years, we've had very few issues. But if there was an issue where, for instance, a seller didn't send something and suddenly closed their shop and I couldn't get hold of them then basically the bank would intervene 
and get the money back for the customer. So um, so there's no risk to the the, the customer really. And um, and from the seller's point of view, you know, they're in control of their own finances. It's you know, I'm getting my commission from their sale. But apart from that, the um the, the money is going straight from the customer to the seller. It's it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because when you hear some people like, oh, buy British. Oh, well, still buying British, it's just on Etsy. But actually we could be buying British on a British site, <laughs> which yeah, is absolutely keeping and, it here. And, yeah, and, and it's funny actually on my Instagram post, which kind of um blew up I, I got lots of messages from Brits abroad saying why can't we sell with you we want we want to sell with you and uh and, and no so we are very much um very much just um just sellers within the the UK but it does mean that you can you can be absolutely sure that you know when you buy something on the site that it's been handmade by someone somewhere in the UK in their studio their garage their garden their office their dining room table wherever it is they do their work but it's um you know you're genuinely supporting a, a small business you know that's based in in britain and i kind of i kind of see that as shopping local as well actually i know that mm. you kind of think as shopping local being shopping in your town but but yeah shopping within the uk kind of keeping all the money within the country is is definitely um a good thing at the moment and and they are true crafters and not just buying stuff from shops and selling it on etsy Oh, absolutely! And I, there was a um, there was a program on uh, on Watchdog earlier um, in the year. I don't know if you caught it, where there was um, there there was somebody actually on Etsy that was buying things from B and M. They weren't even doing anything with them; they were just listing them as handmade in a shop. <laughs> I think that that's part of the problem with um, with Etsy, I guess, is that it's so big that it's impossible to police. Yeah, it doesn't have the checks and measures in place. No, no. And there's lots of, um, you know, you, there's lots of people reselling things on there because you can do um, kind of an image search and you'll see, um, you know, 20 sellers all selling the same thing. And um, and quite often they use the stock image from, um, you know, from the supplier's website. They don't even mm-hmm. take the, the image. And, and the sad thing is that, of course, there are there are some amazing sellers on Etsy. And, um, you know, some people who are, are doing tremendously well because Etsy's got such a huge reach and, uh, you know, such a global audience. And it is a shame that they're now having to sit alongside uh, resellers. And I, I did, um, I heard a story the other day where somebody had basically kind of copied their shop, their whole shop, including their products and their product descriptions. And then they had reported the original shop to Etsy as selling you know not handmade stuff and having copied the images and <laughs> the, and etsy closed down the the original shop and again this poor lady um had no recourse and she um she did this appeal with with etsy and basically they came back and their final thing was you know do not contact us again this matter will not be discussed i think she'd been on there for four or five years i just think that that's that's so wrong that you know people can have their livelihood completely uh, you know literally if people have got their eggs in one basket and it's mm. empty and they close them down then um you know that that's horrific i mean that's just ridiculous because you just think well you just need to look at when they started yeah. <laughs> and that's, yeah. that's evidence enough surely but, but i think that again that goes back to the whole problem that it's you know it's not people that are making mm-hmm. these decisions you know that it, it's bots and ai and automated systems and actually there's not somebody somewhere in an etsy building you know looking at exactly that you know the date someone started how many feedback they've they've got you know and everything else that's connected to their shop you know they're just um they're, they're not doing that because it's you know because it's some kind of automated bot called henry or amy or something that that clearly is um is not human what what would your advice be to to sellers on on Etsy and indeed buyers from from people who are buying from from Etsy? Well, I think that as a buyer, you're in a very safe position, if you like, because you're not really going to be affected. You know, ap- apart from probably that you wouldn't be very happy if you knew that you were paying your money for, say, a beautiful handmade wooden clock. And actually the person that you're paying and thinking you're supporting a small business isn't going to get the money for three months. Um, but, you mm-hmm. know, I, I think from from a, a from a customer's point of view, 
you know, Etsy probably protects them fairly well because they're holding the money just in case there's any kind of a, a problem for any sellers on there. I think I mean, I've heard a I've heard a few kind of people in the last few days, you know, that they've been there for however many years and they've got this star seller badge and, and they feel slightly untouchable. And I just think with the, you know, literally with the click of a the click of a button, you know, that could change. You know, I, I would always recommend that, um, you know, that you you take ownership of your uh, of your business, if you like. And, um, you know, whether that's making sure you don't have all of your eggs in one basket. So whether you set up on a, a secondary platform or you set your own website up or, you know, you 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 make sure that you've got a really good following on Facebook or um, somewhere on social media or on Instagram so that, you know, if you're shop was closed with the you know with the press of a button that you've still got your audience um mm -hmm. the other thing that i always say to small businesses when they're talking about you know how to to establish and to grow is to have a newsletter and i think that having a newsletter is, is the best thing that a small business can do when they're when they're starting because at the end of the day all of the social media platforms are are flaky <laughs> You know, um, if you put a post on Facebook, um, you know, I've got nearly 50,000 followers, likers on Facebook and probably about 150 get to see a post. And to the point that when I'm doing giveaways and things for the British podcast, I always do it via the newsletter now because I know that that's going to bob into 15,000 people's inboxes, whereas mm -hmm. putting out a post on social media can reach a few people or not, depending upon which way the wind is blowing. So um, no, I do yeah. think that that's kind of a, a good idea to kind of keep your customers close to you really, you know, and if they're happy for you to um, to have their email, then, um, then that's like liquid gold really. So what are your plans for the future now? We obviously are still relatively unknown within the UK. And, and so it's just to keep growing and expanding and um and, and to you know ultimately i would um i, I would like us to be a, a household name you know i'd like us to be the place that people go to when they want something that's genuinely handmade and uh, made in the uk um and, and the feedback we get from our customers when they they come back is that that they love it you know they 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 they, mm -hmm. they really do it's i think it's quite different i think we have a different energy to other places and and people really care, uh, you know, about the reputation of the site as well as them as a seller. So, you know, everything goes out kind of packaged with, um, you know, with the utmost care and a little bit of love. And yeah, so I, I think ju just to become more well known. And obviously, for me, that's a challenge to continually reassess how I can be seen. And, you know, I shout with a loud hailer, you know, wherever people might be listening. We've got really, really lucky, or I've got really, really lucky in the last couple of years. We went to um, Downing Street and did a Christmas market last year. There were just 12 businesses chosen from around the country. I was literally opposite number 10 with around about 200 items from different sellers on my um, on my Christmas setup. Um, so really lucky to get opportunities like that that get me, that get me seen and um, you know, I kind of think every you know e every opportunity. I never say no to an opportunity. Every opportunity that that I'm given and I I take just expands our our circle a bit more, which is brilliant. Well, I'd like to thank you for taking up the opportunity to talk to me. <laughs> oh been... no, no, thank you, Helen. It's it's fantastic, and uh, you know, I've I've followed you for for some years, so it's wonderful to to be able to to chat to you. It's been such a crazy week because. You know, I, I'm actually quite cross on behalf of lots of these sellers with, mm -hmm. with Etsy and, and the way that they think that they can just trample all over people. And I suppose mm -hmm. in a way, you know, it's almost the opposite of, you know, uh, uh, of what we do. So we have um, we have a hub on Facebook, actually, that, that the sellers join when they join the website. And it's such a lovely place to be. And uh, we have a post every morning saying, hello, how are you? What are you doing today? And we um, we have meetups, we have regional meetups. And so it's kind of the opposite of the faceless bot. We're kind of, you know, the really want to be your friends. <laughs> kind of, uh, it's, the, it's almost the opposite, but it's lovely. And, um, 
you know, in lockdown, I thought it'd be nice to have like a summer secret Santa because everyone was a bit miserable. <laughs> and uh, and I thought, well, only if only six people join in, there'll be six people that get something through the post that makes them smile in the middle of mm. the pandemic. And we had over 200 people sign up. And so we had this kind of crazy secret Santa in July swapping thing. But I think that kind of captures just the fact that, you know, we're, we're kind of a just a little band of, of crazy Brits who love handmade and, and, and really like lovely quality things. And um, and, and it, it's a bit of a, a cliche, the whole kind of community over competition. But but people genuinely go out of their way to help people if someone was to post into the hub and say you know this is the favorite thing in my shop um i don't understand why it's never sold then people would say well what about photographing it you know on a person or what about taking it outside what about you know what about these keywords have you thought about adding this in and and quite often that thing will then sell because it's just it's almost like having colleagues i suppose but also people that are, are cheering other people on. We had our first seller who um, who went through 2,500 sales last week. And uh, that was immensely exciting. And obviously I was really excited. The seller was really excited, but everyone else was really excited mm -hmm. as well because it represents, you know, the possibility that they can do the same, just that everyone cheers on everyone else's success, which is, which is brilliant. Yeah, I think it's about it's but when people say, Oh, they're my competition. Well, it's not about that, is it? It's about a, a rising tide raises all ships. So, yeah. you know, you you just if you're helping someone else, they're helping you. You you all grow. Whereas yeah. if you're constantly just in this competitive mode, then you've got you haven't got that support and around you to help you grow. So it's it's very short sighted not to not to grow. It shows also how you're doing things very, very differently to, to other platforms. Yes, so, but I, I mean, um, so, you know, the, the Instagram posts that I did um, earlier in the week, I didn't want to kind of, I, I, I would, I, you know, et, I wouldn't be doing what I was doing now if it wasn't for Etsy, you know, Etsy was the building mm. blocks for a lot of what I do. And so uh, what really I wanted to say to people, you know, if you, if you want an alternative, you know, come and look at us. But, you know, being completely honest that I don't spend two million dollars a day on advertising. I don't have that money. Mm -hmm. to spend. Mm -hmm. um, but what I thought was really lovely on the Instagram post is where some people were asking questions about, you know, what would be acceptable, what wouldn't and how things worked. Um, obviously, it was a few crazy days for me. And there were some of my sellers were jumped in and, uh, and were answering the questions. Um, and, uh, and and that's fantastic. And, you know, there, there were a couple of occasions where by the time I saw the conversation, the person had actually applied to sell and I'd accepted them. So I was kind of behind the drag curve with their with their question. But the fact that someone <laughs> else jumped in and, and answered it was uh, was was just brilliant. And I suppose that epitomizes the kind of support, you know, and, and I, mm. I guess it's like anything, you know, I support them they support each other they support me it's um yeah it's it's really lovely well that's a really good note to end on thank you so much for joining me and I hope it sends some more buyers and sellers your way <laughs> amazing thank you Helen thank you so much for having me on but before we go we need to make sure that everyone knows where they can find you so so list out all of your links please the website is um the British Craft uk. And uh, on socials, we are British Craft House everywhere apart from Twitter, where we are British Crafting. Um, but yes, please do, uh, please do come and find us. Well, that's lovely. Thank you. And thank you for listening. And if you have a topic you'd like me to discuss on the show, you can email me on helen at eastlondonradio.org.uk. And you can find uh, me on my website, thecomplainingcow.co.uk, for information on consumer issues, including your rights and money saving and all that stuff and all the other episodes of the Complaining Cow Consumer Show on East London Radio. And you can find me on Twitter at Complaining Cow and at The Complaining Cow on Instagram and Facebook. And you can get 15% off the books, How to Complain, The Essential Consumer Guide to Getting Refunds, Redress and Results, and 101 Habits of an Effective Complainer with the code ELRCOW. Many thanks and see you next time. Bye.